Hi everyone, it's Brittany Corrigan. Welcome to Some of Each, Episode 9, Sun, Moon, and Stars. This is Some of Each, in which I read to you some fiction, some poetry, and some children's lit on a theme. So we're going to start right in with Sun, Moon, and Stars this week. Um, I'm going to start um, by reading to you from um, the novel that I'm currently reading right now by Erin Morgenstern called The Starless Sea. I'm absolutely enraptured with it. I'm about two thirds of the way through. Um, the premise is um, it takes place in this magical underground library. and. Um, Throughout the book, um, there are several library books that figure prominently in the story, and the chapters from those library books are interspersed among the chapters that um, are telling the story of the characters, and of course are also connected to them. So um, it's wonderful and magical. And so what I'm going to read to you is um, a short chapter from one of the library books that figure in the story. And the book is called Fables and Fortunes, and the chapter from that story, the story from that story, um, is called The Star Merchant. Once there was a merchant who traveled far and wide selling stars. This merchant sold all manner of stars, fallen stars and lost stars and vials of stardust, delicate pieces of stars strung on fine chains to be worn around necks and spectacular specimens fit to display under glass. Fragments of stars were procured to be given as gifts to lovers. Stardust was purchased to sprinkle at sacred sites or to bake into cakes for spells. The stars in the merchant's inventory were carried from place to place in a large sack embroidered with constellations. The prices for the merchant's wares were high, but often negotiable. Stars could be acquired in exchange for coins or favors or secrets, saved by wishful dreamers in hopes that the star merchant might cross their path. Occasionally, the star merchant traded stars for accommodations or transport while traveling from place to place. Stars were traded for nights spent in inns, with company or without. One dark night, on the road, the star merchant stopped at a tavern to while away the time before the sun returned. The merchant sat by the fire drinking wine and struck up a conversation with a traveler who was also staying the night at the tavern, though their paths would take them in different directions come morning. To seeking, the star merchant said as their wine was refilled. To finding came the traditional response. What is it that you sell? The traveler asked, tilting a cup toward the constellation covered sack. This was a topic they had not yet discussed. Stars, the star merchant answered. Would you care to peruse? I shall offer you a discount for being good company. I might even show you the pieces I keep in reserve for distinguished customers. I do not care for stars, the traveler said. The merchant laughed. Everyone wants the stars. Everyone wishes to grasp that which exists out of reach, to hold the extraordinary in their hands and keep the remarkable in their pockets. There was a pause here filled by the crackling of the fire. Let me tell you a story, the traveler said after the pause. Of course, the star merchant said, gesturing for their wine to be replenished once again. <clears throat> once very long ago, the traveler began, time fell in love with fate, passionately, deeply in love. The stars watched them from the heavens, worrying that the flow of time would be disrupted or the strings of fortune tangled into knots. The fire hissed and popped anxiously, punctuating the traveler's words. The stars conspired and separated the two. Afterward, they breathed easier. Time continued to flow as it always had. Fate wove together the paths that were meant to intertwine and eventually fate and time found each other again. Of course they did, the star merchant interrupted. Fate always gets what fate wants. Yet the stars would not accept defeat, the traveler continued. They pestered the moon with concerns and complaints until she agreed to call upon the Parliament of Owls. Here the star merchant frowned. The Parliament of Owls was an old myth, invoked as a curse in the land where the merchant had lived as a child far from this place. Falter on your path and the Parliament of Owls will come for you. The merchant listened carefully as the tale continued. 
the Parliament of Owls concluded that one of the elements should be removed. They chose to keep the one they felt more important. The stars rejoiced as fate was pulled apart, ripped into pieces by beaks and talons. Did no one try to stop them? The star merchant asked. The moon would have certainly, had she been there. They chose a night with no moon for the sacrifice. No one dared intervene save for a mouse who took fate's heart and kept it safe. The traveler said, then paused to take a sip of wine. The owls did not notice the mouse as they feasted. The owl who consumed fate's eyes gained great sight and was crowned the owl king. There was a sound then outside in the night that might have been wind or might have been wings. The traveler waited for the sound to cease before resuming the story. The stars rested smugly in their heavens. They watched as time passed in broken-hearted despair, and eventually they questioned all that they had once thought indisputable truth. They saw the crown of the Owl King passed one to another like a blessing or a curse, as no mortal creature should have such sight. They twinkle in their uncertainty still, even now, as we sit here below them. The traveler paused to finish the last of the wine. The story ended. As I said, I do not care for stars. Stars are made of spite and regret. The star merchant said nothing. The constellation covered bag rested heavily by the fire. The traveler thanked the star merchant for the wine and for the company and the merchant returned the sentiments. Before retiring, the traveler leaned in and whispered in the merchant's ear. Occasionally, fate pulls itself together again and time is always waiting. The traveler left the star merchant alone, sitting and drinking and watching the fire. In the morning, when the stars had fled under the watchful eye of the sun, the star merchant inquired whether the traveler had departed, if there might be time to bid a proper farewell. The star merchant was politely informed that there had been no other guests. So that's a bit from Fortunes and Fables, the star merchant from the Starless Sea by Aaron Morgenstern. I'll let you know how it is when I finish it, but if it's as, it's amazing so far, so I imagine it'll continue and to be that way. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read you some poetry now. I'm going to read you three poems from this little chapbook by Paul Ann Peterson, um, who's an Oregon poet, much beloved, um, was our Oregon Poet Laureate for a while. Um, and so I will um, read you three poems from this little book. And I'm going to start with one called Architecture. The sun's the one who starts it. This struggle some call a war between himself and the moon. Suddenly he's busy strong arming a stretch of mud until it glazes over like a silky quilt, crazing like a checkerboard. His chosen sight, a decided plane. He takes timbers, glass and steel, those building blocks wrought with his master's builder's heat and contrives them into increment, high and dry as, swept, as the swept out sky. Stringer, baffle, joist, and shim, they all please him who banks on altitude and invest, as investment, who rises in the blinding light of foreseeable futures, this sun who set on outranking, outflanking the moon. What can she do? Pale, desirous, what else but pull with a mere sliver of her borrowed light, oceans of water from here to there, then back again. Stream, swamp, and eddy sent to loosen a builder's dreams, to cast his work into settle and shift to watery crumble. She sighs, she dwindles, she holds her breath. She grows and grows full, swollen on slow dissolution. That's architecture. And I'm going to read to you Falling Stars. The thicketed stars struck up conversations with distance, their brief hot scratches curved against the sky's dome. Zipped into a sleeping bag, high on a bluff above the river, I turned my face toward this heaven, this one direction of wonder. Friction suddenly visible, life burned itself out in streaking arcs far above my eyes, yet I couldn't keep from turning away. Off to one side, rising from the opposite bluff, the moon, fat crescent, huge, 
succulent, luminous cream of a moon, copper and gold, big as a wide, wild animal yawn held open on the horizon. Risen, still rising, and I, who'd never before wanted to sleep in the open, chose to stay. Outside my familiar landscape of wallpaper, curtains, doors, I could hear the coyotes throw their great circle of cries up into the air, hear two owls criss and cross their voices through trees. I could turn from moon to stars to moon, watch them to sleep, rouse to see them again, and go again back to sleep in that wide outside. Then wake in morning to find the sleeping bag, my face, hands wet and shining, with what at dawning fell and fell to the ground. And then this last one from this chapbook I'll read to you is one of my favorite poems in the world. <laughs> it's called Beginning with And. Five days into India, and finally, a sight of India's moon. Huge silver crescent with Venus below, these two heavenly creatures above the silhouetted walls of an ancient sultan's city. Moon and evening star, the same moon, same star, that rise wherever I live to beckon darkness down and deeper. All this life I've seen the crescent moon as parenthesis, left or right, a curl of light to hold something in, to mark its end. But here, the crescent is a resting bowl, an outstretched hand cupped to hold its own light, slimmest fingers curving silver into the dark. India's moon is upturned, filling with late dusk's violet blue. It's a calligrapher's single stroke for and, that curving sweep from the Arabic pen, the word that's written before all others, symbol that beckons us to listen. A story begins with and, because it has never ended, will never have to end. So that, um, those are three poems from Fabrication, this little chapbook by Paul Ann Peterson. All right, so now I'm gonna read you another one of my favorite poems in the whole world. So this is from All American Girl by Robin Becker. And um, this is a poem that takes place in a planetarium. It's called The Star Show. Though we're flat on our backs at midnight under the enormous sky, I know I'm really in the Fells Planetarium in Philadelphia where I've come with the other third graders for The Star Show. Tonight, the trailing blazes of white explode across the darkness like firecrackers, and my companions ooh and point and say, over there, though the words are too late to be of use and hang in the air much longer than light. What I remember about the star show is the commentator's calm voice, the miracle spreading overhead as he wooed us in plain English as if he didn't need special gear to show us the sky's mysteries. He needed only the reclining seats, the artificial ceiling shuddering close with its countless stars, our willingness to leave the known earth, our parents, teachers, friends, ourselves, for this uncertain meeting in the dark. He urged us to let our eyes adjust for the journey he asked us to relax as the room began to spin and he whispered in his knowledgeable voice about Jupiter. Like my rabbi appearing suddenly in the dome to discuss Moses, he explained with sorrow that brilliant Galileo had to retract his scientific conclusions before the Inquisition. This made us sad, for we already knew that Galileo was right, that four stars revolved around Jupiter as the earth revolved around the sun. And then, as though someone were shaking out a bedspread, someone shook the sky and all the stars shifted. It was winter, night of the lean wolf. His voice grew cold and we buttoned our sweaters because the temperature was falling and we wanted to follow him wherever he was going, which was December. Across the mountain passes we hunted bear, with the Hopis we cured buffalo hides and predicted the hour of sunrise. 
Who didn't want to linger on that winter mesa with the spotted ponies so close to the stars? There wasn't time. He was galloping towards summer while I sat weeping for what I'd lost, a glimpse of the sadness to come, the astronomer's sure purpose. He guided the constellations from early spring to June, and then the sun rose higher than we thought possible, and the longest day endured. He brought us into a meadow drenched with light, but it was night, we knew it, for now we could name every star. How could he leave us here, now that we had become his, now that he had asked us to learn his heaven? As the chairs began to tilt, he threw the stars across the sky, flung meteors carelessly, and laughed a grown-up laugh. He punctured the darkness with white bullets, and the kids began to shout. The seats fell forward and the sun rose in the auditorium, warming the air. I sat bereft before the retreating stars. Row by row, we stood and blinked into that autumn afternoon as the ordinary jeers and curses filled our mouths. That's the star show from All American Girl by Robin Becker. Oh, love that poem. Okay, I'm gonna read you a couple of my own. Um, so a couple first from Navigation, my first book. Um, those of you who've read it know exactly which poems I'm going to read. So um, this first one is called Constellations. My mother learned that bear claws were made of stars and sword hilts were made of stars and cooking pots were full of stars and W's were drawn with stars from my grandfather, who once was a navigator and pointed the way to where the bombs were dropped. My mother learned words like Ursa Minor, Orion, Cassiopeia, the way other children learn phonics, stars like syllables dancing on my grandfather's teeth and spilling from my grandfather's tongue. My grandfather studied maps of stars and taught my mother to connect the dots like making soup, potato, carrot, broth but he never learned to say, I love you. My grandfather sits sheathed and lidded at one end of the table and my mother tilts away from him like a roof of stars headed for the other side of the globe. And I think we are always making wars. My grandfather points jaggedly at the air and my mother's fingers cover her eyes like constellations, like pictures drawn across the sky. And this next one is the Navigator's Triangle. And it's got a little epigraph at the beginning. The stars were so many there, they seemed to overlap. From Natalie Merchant. Our necks should be built for looking upward. So we could stand for many hours next to each other, staring into the sky, and the weight of our eyes would not tilt onto our spines and remind us to look ahead or down at the bones of our feet. Fifty years ago, my grandfather knew these stars like the streetlights in his own hometown. Ursa Major to Ursa Minor was like a walk around the block. To the North Star, a drive to my mother's school. He could take my mother outside, tilt her head up and say, this is the map of your world. But he couldn't say, I know this because of the war. My mother has always said, your grandfather doesn't talk about it doesn't talk about the years in planes with compasses, maps, and soldiers, how he guided them across the sky from the navigator's triangle outward, from Vega to the Northern Cross to Cassiopeia, and told them just where to let it drop. Last week, I asked my grandfather if he knew which planet hung in the sky across from us, a lit face. He couldn't remember didn't know that it was Jupiter, his moons circling around him, all women, Leda, Io, Europa. I stood next to my grandfather, looking upward, my mother watching us from inside, standing still as a point of light. My mother does not know her father, and I do not know what my grandfather knows. If there are stars behind his eyes that no longer mean what they used to mean, mapping a way to people. Tonight, the sky is dusted with stars in patches dense as the track an eraser leaves across a blackboard. Scorpius curls its tail around Jupiter, the sign of my birth. 
and I imagine my grandfather standing under the sky alone, his head rocked back onto his spine like a fallen star, his hands opening into emptiness, looking up. So those are from my book, Navigation. I'm going to read you two others, and then we'll move on to some folklore. <laughs> so this one's from Daughters, coming out next year. All persona poems, for those of you who don't know, and the voices of daughters of various um, folks. And this one is Astronaut's Daughter. First, you must understand how small we really are. How the intricate world beneath our skins is but a blip. Like that waking moment when your dreams disintegrate to debris. Even the scale of our destruction is minute. Our genocides, our wars, our extinctions and erosions, our ability to change the very atmosphere we're in, melt glaciers, conjure hurricanes and heat. It's all just a speck from out there in the cold and black, out among the whirling gaseous spheres caught in their orbital spins out among the burning bodies of stars, bombarding us with ancient light. My mother knows there is a universe inside her, thousands of possibilities for the formation of life, improbability of collision, rapidity of expansion, tethered floating in a weightless world. And yet she has left me, her little planet, I who cannot escape my elliptical love for her, to travel so far above the earth that I am but atoms among atoms, bumping up against dark matter in my fitful sleep. But my heart is telescopic. I look up and the stars could be street lamps, the moon a sliver of melon she sliced for my plate. I believe that my longing's gravitational. I imagine she can feel it from space from Daughters. And then one last poem. This one's from uh, Breaking, my little chapbook that's currently looking for a home. And this um, was written on the occasion of the first all-female spacewalk, um, which happened outside the International Space Station um, last October. It's called Astro Sisters. On the earth that passes beneath, leaves brighten, nova-like in the cooling air, and young girls ready their costumes for Halloween. Growing bones step into flight suits with embroidered names, transparent globes frame buoyant faces freckled with stars. Miles above, two women navigate the space station in weightless calm, their voices tethered to the woman in mission control who talks them through each task, each measured step to power the solar arrays. Like the pace of this spacewalk, we have come to this moment slowly, when the women do their work in the universe and their male crewmates look out through the glass. As the Astro sisters climb their way back into the airlock, Girl Scout troops are wrapped with attention. Teenage girls in physics class follow the live stream on the miracles of tiny screens in their palms and the little daughters, not yet in school, watch as the hatch door opens. And where once there was darkness, now there is infinite space. That's Astro Sisters from Breaking. All right, so um, I'm gonna give you now a little treat of uh, folklore. Um, so, um, so many creation stories in so many different cultures. Um, and so I've just chosen a small one from you from this book um, called American Indian Myths and Legends, um, which is edited by Richard um, Erdos and Alfonso Ortiz. Um, I used this book for my thesis back at Reed. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna read you a small uh, Wasco legend, and this is called Coyote Places the Stars. One time, there were five wolves, all brothers, who traveled together. Whatever meat they got when they were hunting, they would share with Coyote. One evening, Coyote saw the wolves looking up at the sky. What are you looking up at there, at there my brothers? asked Coyote. Oh, nothing, said the oldest wolf. Next evening, Coyote saw they were all looking up in the sky at something. He asked the next oldest wolf at what they were looking at, but he wouldn't say. It went on like this for three or four nights. 
No one wanted to tell Coyote what they were looking at because they thought he would want to interfere. One night, Coyote asked the youngest wolf brother to tell him, and the youngest wolf said to the other wolves, let's tell Coyote what we see up there. He won't do anything. So they told him, we see two animals up there, way up there, where we cannot get to them. Let's go up and see them, said Coyote. Well, how can we do that? Oh, I can do that easy, said Coyote. I can show you how to get up there without any trouble at all. Coyote gathered a great number of arrows and then began shooting them into the sky. The first arrow stuck in the sky and the second arrow stuck to the first and each arrow stuck into the end of the one before it like that until there was a ladder reaching down to the earth. We can climb up now, said Coyote. The oldest wolf took his dog with him and then the other four wolf brothers came and then Coyote. They climbed all day and into the night. All the next day they climbed. For many days and nights they climbed until finally they reached the sky. They stood in the sky and looked over at the two animals the wolves had seen from down below. They were two grizzly bears. Don't go near them, said Coyote. They will tear you apart. But the two youngest wolves were already headed over, and the next two youngest wolves followed them. Only the oldest wolf held back. When the wolves got near the grizzlies, nothing happened. The wolves sat down and looked at the bears, and the bears sat there looking at the wolves. The oldest wolf, when he saw it was safe, came over with his dog and sat down with them. Coyote wouldn't come over. He didn't trust the bears. That makes a nice picture though, thought Coyote. They all look pretty good sitting there like that. I think I'll leave it that way for everyone to see. Then when people look at them in the sky, they will say, there's a story about that picture and they will tell a story about me. So Coyote left it that way. He took out the arrows as he descended so there was no way for anyone to get back. From down on the earth, Coyote admired the arrangement he had left up there. Today, they still look the same. They call those stars Big Dipper now. If you look up there, you'll see that three wolves make up the handle, and the oldest wolf, the one in the middle, still has his dog with him. The two younger wolves make up the part of the bowl under the handle, and the two grizzlies make up the other side, the one that points toward the North Star. When Coyote saw how they looked, he wanted to put up a lot of stars. He arranged stars all over the sky in pictures and then made the big road across the sky with the stars he had left over. When Coyote was finished, he called Meadowlark over. My brother, he said, when I am gone, tell everyone when they come to look up in the sky and see the stars arranged this way, I was the one who did that. That is my work. And now Meadowlark tells that story about Coyote. So that was a story um, recounted to these editors by Barry Lopez in 1977, Coyote Places the Stars. It's a Wasco tale. All right, so we're going to end with a children's book. Tonight I have for you a book that was mine when I was a little kid, one of my very favorites, When the Sun Was Brought Back to the Sky, and it's by Mira Ginsberg. The pictures are by, which I'll show you, are by Jose Aruego and Ariane Dewey. And you can see it's got my little book plate from when I was a kid in it still. <laughs> so, when the sun, or how the sun was brought back to the sky. Here we go. One day, gray clouds huge as mountains covered the sky. They stayed on and on and on, and the sun did not come out for three whole days. The chicks got worried. It was cold and sad without sunshine. Where could the sun have gone, they cried. We'll go and bring it back into the sky. How will you find it, clucked the mother hen. Do you know where it lives? We don't know where it lives, the chicks said, but we shall ask the way of anyone we meet. The mother hen prepared the chicks for the long journey. She gave each one a grain of rye and a poppy seed. That ought to do it. <laughs> okay. The chicks set out. They walked and walked until they reached a vegetable patch. In the middle of it was a huge head of cabbage and on the bottom leaf sat a snail. He was large with big horns and he carried his house on his back. Snail, snail, the chicks asked, can you tell us where the sun lives? I don't know. Ask the magpie over on the fence. She might tell you. The busy magpie did not wait for the chicks to come to her. She flew down to them, chattering, clattering with her beak. Chicks, chicks, where are you going? Where are you going, chicks, chicks? The sun has not come out for three days. We're going to look for it. I'll come with you, I'll come with you. 
Do you know where the sun lives? I don't, but the rabbit may know. His home is in the furrow right behind the cabbage patch, the magpie said. I'll take you there. The rabbit saw the guests were coming. He wiped his whiskers with his paw and opened his gate as wide as it would go. Rabbit, rabbit, the chicks peeped. The magpie chattered. We are looking for the sun. Do you know where it lives? Well, I don't, but my neighbor the duck may know. Her home is in the reeds by the brook. The rabbit led them to the brook. The duck's house stood right by the water and a boat was tied up nearby. Are you home, neighbor? cried the rabbit. I'm home, home, quacked the duck. The sun's been gone for three days now. I can't dry out. Well, we're looking for the sun, cried the chicks, the magpie and the rabbit. Do you know where it lives? I don't, but there's a tree across the brook. The hedgehog's home is in the hollow among the roots. He's sure to know. He knows everything. They got into the boat and crossed the brook. The hedgehog lay rolled up, dozing under the tree. Hedgehog, hedgehog, cried the chicks, the magpie, the rabbit, and the duck. Do you know where the sun lives? It hasn't been out in the sky for three days. Maybe it is sick. The hedgehog thought a while and said, of course I know where it lives. Behind my tree, there is a mountain. On top of the mountain, there's a cloud. Over the cloud lives the silver moon, and from the moon to the sun, it's only a short walk. The hedgehog took a stick and walked ahead to show everybody else the way. They climbed to the top of the mountain where the cloud was resting. The chicks, the magpie, the rabbit, the duck, and the hedgehog got up on the cloud. They sat down comfortably to make sure they wouldn't fall off, and the cloud flew with them straight to the moon's house. The moon saw them coming and quickly lit its silver horns. Moon, moon, cried the chicks, the magpie, the rabbit, the duck, and the hedgehog. Show us where the sun lives. It hasn't come out for three days, and everything is sad and cold without it. The moon brought them directly to the sun's house. The windows were dark. There was no light anywhere. The sun, they thought, must be asleep and didn't want to wake. The magpie chattered loudly, the chicks peeped, the duck quacked, the rabbit flapped his ears, and the hedgehog banged his stick on the door. Sun, sun, world's delight, come out, give us warmth and light. Who is that shouting under my window, grumbled the sun. Who isn't letting me sleep? Your friends, the chicks, the magpie, the rabbit, the duck, and the hedgehog. We've come to wake you. It's time to get up. Oh, oh, groaned the sun, how can I show myself now? For three long days, gray clouds shut me out of the sky. I don't even know how to shine anymore. The rabbit heard this and he ran down to the well and brought a pail of water. The duck began to wash the sun. The magpie dried it with a towel. The hedgehog polished it with his bristles and the chicks picked every speck of dust off its face. The sun looked out of the sky, clean, fresh, and golden, spreading light and warmth everywhere, and all the animals slid down its rays back to their homes. The mother hen came out into the sunshine. Cluck, cluck, she called to her chicks. They gathered around her, running here and there, looking for crumbs and seeds, as bright and gay and golden as the sun itself. And if you don't believe my story, look out of the window and you'll see. The hen is there, the chicks are there, and the sun is there. And doesn't that prove that every word I said is true? All right, so that was How the Sun Was Brought Back to the Sky by Mira Ginsburg. So we heard that. We heard some work of mine. We heard a folktale from this um, American Indian Myths and Legends. We heard from All American Girl by Robin Becker, Fabrication by Paul Ann Peterson, and my current fave, The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. So if you liked what you heard, I hope you'll order books online um, or from your local bookstores curbside and support them during this time. And I'll look forward to seeing you all next week. Good night.